Ottawa Senators are going to have a new owner. That much we knew. Now we have a name. It's going to be Michael Anlauer and his group of local investors that take over. Uh, we bring in Graham Nichols to help us kind of, I don't know, take a first look at this and, and what it all means. How's it going today, man? It's going, it's going well. No, how are you doing, Matt? I'm all right. See, I wasn't sure. We'll let the good listener in. It's pretty early in the day on a Tuesday. It's one o'clock. I know you're on vacation, so it's I was one o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure whether or not he was going to bring a pint to the table. Uh, I brought one as well, but I had to pour it. So uh, <laughs> had you not, I wasn't going to tell anyone I was having one. And uh, the fact you did gives me the courage to say, yeah, I got one from our friends at the Need a Beer Company going right now. It is their uh, Wrecking Ball Coconut Stout. Been sitting in my fridge for a while. And and maybe, I don't know, like you said, it's 1 p.m. or whatever. It's coming in at about 7%. So we're, we're getting right into it here today. What do you bring, lad? Ooh, I've got a uh, Danish, Danish beer called Tuborg. So that's what I'm rocking today. Yeah. Beer. Yeah. Nice and nice and light. And yeah, it's a good summer beer. For sure. So we pulled them out of uh, vacation mode to come talk to Pocky. Appreciate that. No, it's all good. But uh, like I said, it's it's going to be the Michael Andlauer group by all accounts here for the last several days. We kind of figured it was down to him and as well uh, t- still, uh, I guess the Nico Sparks group kind of still hanging around but no one really believed i guess that they were still in it and then the uh, the kimmel brothers uh as well but uh were you i i, I certainly you weren't shocked we knew there was only a couple names left but be surprised was this always sort of the guy you thought it might be what was your first reaction when you saw it today i feel like he was the guy who was kind of like earmarked right from the beginning right like even before like ryan reynolds and stuff i think he, this he was identified as someone who'd have interest right away uh obviously as the connection to the nhl which helps it seems like it's a it's a very close knit group uh, at the ownership level, and I, I feel like if you have ownership ties and, and the league's familiar with you and your work and and you know and your and your financial situations, I think that gives you an edge on the competition. I think you know you look at some of the other um, bidders and stuff uh, who are limited, especially like to, uh, Steve Apostolopoulos. Um, like the league didn't have a connection to him, so those are those were a bit of unknowns. You mentioned Nico Sparks as well, so like those were unknowns that I I just don't know if the league really want to deal with them uh as much but yeah it's it's exciting right like i don't i never really had a vested interest in in who was going to come in and own i think the bar has been set so low in ottawa it absolutely did not matter who came in uh it's going to be a significant upgrade um but yeah so ann lauer comes in he he buys a 90 percent uh ownership stake of the team he'll have controlling interests and uh he'll be the one making the sole decisions right now the melnick daughters maintain a 10 percent ownership but um they'll be around but um, it's it's a great day for the organization. I think if we can sweep away the vestiges of the Eugene Mellick era, put that past behind us, uh, you know, it's been probably what fifteen years, almost twenty years of uh, turbulent chaos uh, and stewardship of this franchise since he since he bought it in two thousand three. So um, it, it's just a great day, and I think you know for everything the fans have endured in the city, all all the hoopla, all the all the off ice drama and antics, and just unnecessary unnecessary drama this is just it's a welcome uh, sigh of relief and you know if it's just a moment to celebrate and just kind of take a step back and say all right finally like here's here's let's crack a beer for a sense of normalcy and optimism and everything that new ownership can bring in and you know if you look at the front office i think fans recognize that it's one of the smallest front offices in the league they have one of the smallest scouting staffs in the league they rely on third-party um analytic data to help, uh, to help with their decision making. So there's not, there's not a lot of in-house, uh, boots on the ground work being done at that level. So I think, you know, new ownership, new capital, uh, the opportunity to bring, uh, Daniel Alfredson back into the fold in some capacity, uh, you, you know, new ideas, fresh faces. Uh, it's just really exciting to know that you, this could be, just a, a new chapter for the team and just a new chapter for the organization of bringing fresh voices and fresh opinions and, and help kind of push us in a new direction. Because I think, you know, the Dorian area has kind of run stagnant a little bit. Um, I, I think everybody loves some of the young pa- players that have been cultivated through this rebuild stuff, but I think there's still a lot of heavy lifting that needs to be done to put this on the right path and, and push us forward faster and better than it otherwise would have. So it's exciting. So uh, I'll, I'll tell you, my first reaction was actually just relief. Um, I don't want to pretend I'm not going to bullshit my listeners. I am connected in no way. I don't know any important people. I don't talk to important people. I'm not an insider, but I have friends who know people, right? We all know people who know people. And, uh, I had someone tell me that had the Kimmel group gotten the team, 
Matt Sundin was likely to be part of their front office structure. And that was going to be really hard on me. So I'm, <laughs> I'm happy that that's not going to be something I'm staring down here. You've said it's a great day and it certainly is. And we're going to look forward in a second, but let me ask you just one last time before you totally turn the page here to, to take a look back on the sale process with me, because there's been some negativity over the last couple of weeks. And I think some of it is understandable from the fans that this wasn't getting done fast enough, right? And then we start to hear that the Ryan Reynolds group is walking away. And then we hear that the, I'm not even going to try the big, long Greek last named guy was walking away, um, last Friday and fans are starting to say only the senators again, right? And this is a gong show again. And, and these sorts of things that, as you said, fans in this market have been beaten down for a long time over. I still think there's they're in a a much better situation now than they were 15 months ago. But this road was almost, I, I was going to say needlessly difficult. I guess I don't know what was needless and what wasn't. But this was less fun, maybe, for Senators fans than perhaps it could have been, right? They're, they're set up well now, but it's sure. shocked getting here, right? Like, yeah, but I think there's like there's also the complications of like, obviously you have to recognize the fact that like you're talking about a $1 billion deal for the for the arena and and the franchise itself, right? So like that's that's a huge amount of money uh, being bought. So it's going to be complicated. It's going to take time to play out. But I think, you know, if, if fans weren't concerned about the timing of the sale, right? Like it, the more it would drag on in the summer, it's like, okay, well now we have the NHL draft. We have the start of free agency. Like these are kind of pivotal moments in a, a team's or an organization's off season where like a really, really, really important decisions have to be made. Cause that's, those are the periods of time when trade activity happens, draft activity happens. And, you know, really important decisions that affect the future of this team from a player personnel standpoint take place. And I think, you know, uh, the concern for many people is that, well, you know, if if we have a lame duck general manager in place in Pierre Dorian and he's pulling these decisions, like what were his interests? Like, is he looking out for the short term interests of himself? Is he looking out for the best mid to long term interests of the organization? Like, what's he doing? What's, uh, you know, what's what's driving him? I think those are the concerns. And, and you know, it, this process has taken a long time. And especially I think fans are frustrated by the fact that reports were coming out in the last week or two where. It's like, okay, now it's a capital gains issue where the Melnick daughters and, and their, their handlers are fighting for, you know, do not have to pay when they sold the thing that that was going to, well, exactly. It's like, you know, isn't that something that you could have had to forethought to, yeah, exactly. So it's like, you know, for that to come up at like the 11th hour or whatever it is, then I think it is frustrating. You hear those stories. You're like, oh God, here we go again. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been culminated. The deal's done. Uh, you know, you don't have to worry about that stuff anymore. And I think it's like a fresh breath of relief. They have the board of governors meeting in nine days. So I don't know whether this will get signed, sealed and delivered, uh, at that board of governors meeting where everything gets approved. And then Ann Lauer could come in and start making decisions on who he wants to bring into the fold. Um, but those are decisions that need to be made very quickly because you have the draft on June 28th and 29th. Right. So uh, it's it's gonna be really it's gonna be really tough. It's gonna be really interesting. I don't know what's gonna happen. Do you let do you let Dorian and company just run that draft and then walk away from him in July, like after free agency, or do you just like relieve him as soon as you take over ownership of this franchise and then bring in your guys? Like, how do you? I don't know. Yeah, a lot has to happen very quickly. Does it almost help that the Melnick daughters and that estate still have ten percent ownership? Right? Could you rue them and the current board? relieve the management group, hire the people you want. I, I think it's incredibly um, nerve wracking or uh, it, it, I'd be up, I'd be nervous about relieving my GM and, you know, those, my, my front office people a week and a half before the draft and installing someone new. I almost would let perhaps the draft run its course the way it, it might, but yeah, then the week after, you know, before free agency brings someone, but I wonder if you could go through the Melnick daughters, you know, relieve Pierre Dorian, if that's what you're going to do, bring in Steve Steos or whoever it's going to be, that seems to be the name, name that's floating around out there, and kind of give some direction as to what you'd like to see happen here through that kind of small door that the that estate being involved with both groups, right, is the seller, but also being involved as still part of the ownership group now. 
Yeah, I would imagine mechanisms are in place, right? Until like the ownership's approved, you probably get away with doing that. Um, and I think it, you know, it, you mentioned Steve Stavos. If they wind up bringing in Steve Stavos, like obviously he's the, G- the GM of the Hamilton Bulldogs at the OHL, and he's had success there. Uh, so I suppose if there is someone who knows like the junior ranks, bringing him in at that stage might not necessarily be a bad thing because at least he'll have his finger on the pulse of what's going on in the Canadian Hockey League. So um i guess in that sense maybe there are worse choices to make as a general manager like personally like i i was kind of hoping for like an eric tolsky type uh or alex mandricki like you know like kind of like that new that new age um brilliant brilliant kind of analytical mind coming into the organization give them their first crack because i don't i don't know if they're i don't I don't know. I don't, I, I, I just don't know. Has there, I don't even think there's been one of those analytical hires yet. Right. It's all still kind of like the former player vibes or guys who've guys who've gone through the OHL or, or what, what have you like Kyle Dubas and stuff, but he has at least a, some kind of background in that area as, as well. So, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the, in the next like nine days, two weeks. Cause there's a lot, you know, if, if he takes over the ownership of this team in nine days, then you know you have the draft about a week later so it, a lot can happen very quickly and it's going to be really interesting to see what happens or maybe you just hold on to Pierre Dorian because you don't want state secrets being left out I have no idea I have no idea how it's going to go it's it's fascinating to watch and uh, I'm kind of anxious to see I'm anxious to see how they're going to build this out like I, there's so much optimism and and you know like beefing the staff up like if Steos comes in as the GM then are you going to hire a president of hockey operations where does Daniel Alfredson fit um, you know, you have to go have you hire uh, analytics minds to to start up, you know, a hockey analytics department. And then who are you bringing in? And I've mentioned multiple times on my site and on podcasts. I believe I've mentioned on your podcast as well. Like, there's a lot of analytical uh, minds out there who started as Senators fans are who are from Ottawa. So, like, there's there's a situation that you can leverage to bring some of the very brilliant minds in on the public sphere and and have them. Uh, have them build up your hockey ops department. It's it's exciting to think about, and it's just uh, it's it's an awesome time, man. It, this has been such a long time coming, and I, I just feel really happy for the fans and and the people of this city. It's a great step forward. What do you think the odds are that Pierre Dorian gets to stay? Because I, one of the popular debates that you see around hockey Twitter is how much was this Pierre Dorian having bad judgment and you know not doing a very good job. And how much of it was quite legitimately what he was dealing with from above in the ownership uh, stages. I think it's it's hard to just, you know, pick and choose. We've seen him make moves that weren't necessarily budget moves coming from ownership that weren't very good. And it, we've seen him make some pretty good moves here since the, the reins have sort of been taken off of him. Do you think there's a chance that Ann Lauer doesn't replace him right away? Maybe he wants to bring in one or two of his own people to augment the group, but says... Let's see what this guy can do when he has the resources that he needs and isn't being restrained from above. Yeah, I, I tried to look at like a Pierre Dorian track record. Um, you know, whether I was looking at his free agent signings, his restricted free agent signings, his trades or his draft, his draft selection since taking over the team in uh, 2016. And I, I just think if you go back through his trade history, I think if you look back at his draft record, um, there's not. I, I just don't see a ton of upside. To be honest with you, uh, like just to be frank, like he, he's made, he hasn't made, he's made some terrible, terrible, terrible moves. Um, I, I feel like his draft record uh, is really inflated and overstated. Once you get, once you look at who the organization has taken outside their top five, top ten draft selections, you know, which you're supposed to hit home runs with, anyways. Um, I just feel like he's had a long tenure, and some of the mistakes he's making are still like the mistakes that he made six, seven years ago, you know, uh, as much as you want to say like, yeah, last off season, he brought in Claude Giroux and we've had this conversation before. I like, I don't think Claude Giroux came here because necessarily because like Pierre Dorian was a GM. I think he wanted to return home. He saw the young kids. He chose Ottawa. He didn't, yeah. He chose Ottawa more than he chose the senators. And, um, you know, I'm not trying to slight the team or Dorian or anything, but I think that's just the matter of fact. And, you know, he traded for Alex to I think more than anything, I think you can appreciate the process of that. I know what he was trying to do. He got a young, he, for the, one of the first times he targeted a guy who was like in his young twenties who had success in this league before, and he paid a good price to get him. Uh, and I understood the process. Like he's made some, he's made some good moves, but at the same time, like most, I feel like most of Dorian's best moves were made after like he, he kind of got rid of his own mistakes. 
Yeah, so he's just cleaning up his own mess. And it's like, well, you can you can celebrate the fact that he got out from underneath those deals, but those deals are still being made in the first place. So like, it kind of, uh, does it erase itself? I Like, I don't know how you evaluate that properly, but um, yeah, for me, it's just like the track record of trades has been terrible. Um, and his draft record, I feel like is overstated. He's made some good signings and stuff. Like closure is probably the best free agent signing that the organization that has ever had. So you got to give him credit for that. But at the same time, I think you have to recognize that he chose Ottawa. He didn't choose Peridor and he didn't choose the players on this team. So like, I understand the sentiment that you want to give Dorian an opportunity to work, uh, underneath someone else who isn't Eugene Melnick. But at the same time, it's like, you can't, you can't just like wash away all the mistakes and blame those on the owner. Like, you know, like you chose that position. You chose that position and you chose those work circumstances because you knew that was the only opportunity that you'd have to get a general manager job, general manager job in this league. And you can't like having a, a, a crappy boss is an excuse for you doing bad work. Like you can still do good work while working for a terrible owner. Sure. You know, um, is he volatile? Does he have swings? You know, I like going from Matt. I think what you can excuse the organization a little bit is like, coming off their stand, their Eastern Conference final appearance in 2017. They went out and traded for Matt Duchesne, even though all the underlying numbers said that the team was bad, even though they lost like quality depth guys and like Mark Bathot and like Clark MacArthur and replaced them with like Johnny Oduya and like, I don't know, one of, one of Guy Boucher's old like Tampa Bay guys. Um, you know, it, it's like, you know, if you look at that on paper, you're like, this is probably a terrible idea to go all in on, on Matthew Shane at the time. It's just one of those things where it's like you, you go ahead and you acquire Matthew Shane. And then three months later, you're like, Oh, we got to rebuild. We have to rebuild. We absolutely have to rebuild. It's like, well, you just traded a ton of, like a ton of prospect capital and Kyle Turris to get in a player that you're probably now going to have to wind up trading like next year when he becomes another, like when he has like UFA rights the following off season. It's just like, I don't know. Uh, that's the one where I can see it's where like, all right, the philosophy changes because that's the direction of ownership where they want to cut costs and, and trim it down and everything else. But it's like, you know, I, I think if you just go through his track record in terms of trades and everything else, like they've made a lot of mistakes. They made a lot of mistakes that could have been mitigated. And even the moves that I think you, you celebrate, like I've, I've gone out on a limb and said, you know, like I didn't mind the Dadnoff tra- uh, signing. I didn't mind the Debrinkat sign or uh, trade. And like, those were deals where it's like, okay, I understand the process, but unfortunately like the deals didn't work out. Like maybe to break out resigns and he, and he wants to stay here in Ottawa. But like, I like, if it's true that he submitted a list of teams that he prefers to get dealt to and he wants to be traded, like, I think, you know, like that, that, you know, it was a calculated gamble that blew up in the, in the uh, general manager's face. And at that stage, I think like he has to kind of bear responsibility for that. He knew the risks involved and you would say enough like Travitanic who was on waivers and then you give up an asset to go get it like little things like I read it's like I don't know what you think you see here that you know one else sees but I, it just uh, let's go inside this deal here a little bit I wonder if you have a better handle on than I do what percentage of this is made up of local ownership because that seems to be something that Sens fans are excited about and rightfully so that it's not just Michael Anlauer he has some local investors as part of the group uh, the people who uh, own Farm Boy. Um, yep, Jeff York. Right, yeah. with one or two other ones. Do you know how big of a percentage of this they have? Is it like a 51-49 kind of thing or more like a 70-30 thing? I haven't seen anything publicized, now, But I've only read the same reports that you have, like Jeff York and the Maholcher family from Claridge um, are involved. Uh, but it's good. Like, I think like having local ownership is good uh, in the sense that like they'll, that those people should have their finger on the pulse of like what what Ottawa is, what makes it tick, what the fans feel, um, what this what this fan base has gone through. And I think Jeff York obviously has the family connection to Jason, right? So like there's he'll have more of an informed opinion of that than probably anyone, right? So uh it, it's exciting and it's those guys will help. They'll they'll help mend the fences and uh, you know and kind of build that responsibility and that bridge like so many bridges have been burned in the past through ownership like with the local business community the season ticket base everything else vendors former players like you know you go down the you go down the list of people who've been turned off uh during the last 15 years and it's like yeah it's no surprise that this team is hemorrhaging cash it's just it's a comedy of mistakes it's it's crazy what's happened here uh, over the last while so it's just it's such a fresh breath of air uh, and it's just a time of optimism. I think everybody has to be really excited with where things can go from here. And, you know, I'm hoping that the fan response will be, uh, huge and, and people will get season tickets again and, and you'll get some of that local business community back and money will start coming back into this team. And then, 
you know, the next big issue once, once this ownership uh, sale is processed and goes through, uh, is all right. Now, how do we get LeBreton Dion? Yeah. Like, how do we get LeBreton Flats done? You know, that's, that's the important next step. How do we get this team downtown and accessible to the most amount of people, um, as possible? And that's the best way to like maximize your revenue streams and, and keep things going in a positive direction. So, you know, there's a lot, you know, it's nine days, nine days until the board of governors meeting. Yeah. And there's a lot of work that needs to get done quickly. So it's gonna be fun. Yeah. And maybe that kind of dovetails into the next thing I wanted to ask you. But as you said, the board of governors meeting is nine days away. That's where the, the board can rubber stamp this and say, you know, yes, we accept this guy as an owner. And that's, you know, going to happen. He's already part of the club. They know him with his time owning part of the, uh, the Canadians. So, but he won't officially, there's going to be a lot of I's to dot and T's to cross before he's officially handed the keys and, and whatever. That'll take a couple months here. But I wonder, you know, you've referenced, you know, let's, let's leave the draft and the first day of free agency out of this. Can you kind of, you know, on top of uh, the, the idea of getting a new deal to get downtown, like what are some of the other priorities for this new ownership group of things that you'd like to see turned around quickly or th- that they're going to focus on here early on in their ownership? Well, I think targeting the French community is huge. And I think that's like one of the understated parts of this community is like, you know, you have Gatineau right across the bridge. Like, how do you, how do you bring more people, uh, from that side of the river, uh, onto the Ontario side to like become invested in this team? I know there's a lot of Montreal Canadiens fans on that side of the river, but there's a lot of, uh, Ottawa Sunders fans as well. And, you know, they have to do a better job of marketing themselves towards those people and bring those dollars in um, over here. Uh, I think, you know, like a downtown arena will obviously help. It'll be a lot closer in proximity to the bridges there, obviously, um, as opposed to Canada. And I, that's obviously going to be a priority for them. Um, I think, I don't know, like, like I, I talked about Daniel Offerson. I think like hiring more community ambassadors like Mark Borfiesk is pretty good. I think he'd be an excellent hire just as like a community ambassador. Yeah. Just like a guy who's from Ottawa, who's just like such a, uh, such a voice. Um, Got some interview experience. Oh man. Yeah, he does. Excellent interviewer. Excellent interviewer. Actually, they should just bring Bor, just hire Bor Vieski back to interview Michael Adler. I'm going to tweet that. Amazing. All right. <laughs> As drummed up on the Tolkien off the plot. <laughs> yeah. I don't, know. This, I don't even know if he has Twitter anymore. I can't even tag him. <laughs> we've, we've stumbled upon a million dollar idea here. The yeah. New official uh, interviewer of the Ottawa Senators. The yeah. Leporo. <laughs> Good <laughs> <chain> <laughs> on Michael Ann Lowler. <laughs> same room, same backdrop, everything ideal. Uh, yeah, it, he is one of those guys, and we let uh, Graham Pound in sweet here, that, you know, the community did love. He was a, a good ambassador. Like he showed up for all kinds of charity things, all sorts of causes. He ends up going down to Nashville, playing a while there and, and now retires. He would be an easy guy to bring back in similar to, you know, what they've already started doing with Chris Neal and, and Chris Phillips. And, you know, Alfie is obviously going to, I would assume have a fairly large role in management, but yeah, that that's an easy name of a guy that I, I expect we'll be hearing more from Jason York again. Um, but, you know, it, those are easy guys that the community likes that you should be kind of reaching out to, right? Oh, yeah. I, it's like, I, I think what you'll probably wind up seeing is like a, a bunch of an alumni and stuff will flood back to the theme. I think you'll like, you know, like Jason Spencer just left Toronto. He's got a lot of front office experience. Maybe he can become. No, but like he'd be a perfect fit, right? Like families from Ottawa. I don't know if he'll leave Toronto. Like I think, uh, you know, Elliot Friedman touched upon that. One of the 32 Thoughts podcasts. Uh, recently in the last week or two, he was talking about that. Like he, he doubted that Spets would leave Toronto just because of his family connection there and stuff. Oh, we but, all learned how to worship remotely. <laughs> yeah, very true. Very true. So like he'd be a, he'd be an interesting guy to like maybe add in, in, in an AGM capacity, right? Like he has experience doing it in Toronto. So maybe that's an option or an avenue the team could explore. I think Mark Borowiecki again, like in a, in a community ambassador role, would be fantastic. Having him work with like Chris Phillips and Chris Neal. Uh, would just be fantastic for the team. Uh, Daniel Alfredson. I don't know what kind of capacity you want him in, maybe like player development or maybe eventually you try and groom him for like a president of hockey operations role. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like having him back in the fold and being like, you know, it was it was great seeing him around the rink, right? Like last year. And just, you know, just having him around and involved is, is just a huge opportunity. And then obviously, like, you know, they got to hire a head coach too. And it's going to be, well, I shouldn't say that DJ Smith hasn't been fired yet, but right. um yeah, I think all the tea leaves, whether it was Dorian's exit interview or anything else, like he didn't exactly give him a, a blessing. So I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what happens because a lot has to happen in the next few months. And then 
we haven't even talked about like Alex DeBrincat's uh, situation. So like some kind of work has to be done there. And if it's Pierre Dorian. I think he's more or less interested in staying now. We talked about this, Rob and I, on the Monday morning show about, you know, does is he legitimately just wanting to wait this out and see what it was going to look like? And, and Rob sort of hinted at what you had said a few minutes ago as well, that, you know, I might have believed that a little more if he hadn't already submitted a list of places like, yeah, here's where I'm, here's where I'm looking to get to. Yeah. And I think the thing for me, just like, if you know new ownership's coming in and you want to see new ownership come in, like, why would you even have to wait to see what it is? You know, it's probably going to be better and more committed than what's already here. So yeah. So like how I, I like, I don't know, maybe like, I just don't have any idea of how that impacts yeah. what he's thinking, but I, I, I don't know. Maybe that's just the out. Maybe that's the easy out to say, well, that's the, you know, that's the excuse I'll use. So at least I don't get, um, you know, burned in the, in the local media or burned with the fans and, you know, like, uh, yeah, but I mean, like, I don't know if you came out, if you came out and said, listen, I have a young family, I'm going to do what's best for them. And if I decide to return to be closer to the family in, in the United States and like, how do you fault a guy for that? You can't, you know, you can't, uh, you can't blame him for that. Even though I think like Ottawa is an excellent city to raise a young family. Like I'm doing that right now, yeah. you know, and it's just, it's a great place to be. The people are friendly. It feels like a relatively safe community. Um, so like, I don't know. How do you fault Ottawa? Yeah. It's got cold winters and stuff, but it's got some beautiful summers. It's got some great, uh, great places to see. There's lots of water. There's cottage country. Like there's so much going on here that, uh, that it, this should be attractive to people. It's a great place to play too. I think the fan base is passionate. The media is, I don't even find like the fans or the media are overly critical either. It's just, it's a pretty easy place to play. So I don't know. I see a lot of desirable qualities about Ottawa personally, but I'm also extremely biased because I live here. <laughs> and, um, no, it's true. And I, I wonder, like, do you think it's still, you know, the, the, one of these early priorities will be the arena thing. Do you think it's still Le Breton or bust, or we've heard throughout this process that, that some of these groups are exploring other areas of town, um, certainly closer to downtown than they are now. But do you think Le Breton is still kind of where they have to get to, or would you be open to looking around? I think Le Breton is probably the best place for it. Um, just based off like proximity to Preston. I, I obviously it's not like downtown, downtown, like close to the Byward Market and stuff, but yeah, I mean, just build an expensive new rail system that it, like, well, exactly. And I think like, yeah, it's, I mean, you got to get people in and out and I, you also have the bridges that are right there. Right. So it's like, to me, it's a, that would be the easiest place to put it. But I mean, you know, like Bayview's not too far away. It's just down the, it's just down the uh, track a little bit from it. But, um, I think, yeah, just in terms of proximity to Preston, the opportunity to kind of like have carte blanche to do whatever you want at La Breton Flats in terms of restaurants, bars, uh, condos, everything else. Like you have an opportunity to create like a little community and pocket there. I think that'd be the easiest thing to do. And some of the other places like Lee's Avenue or, uh, oh God, what was the other one? It was like, well, I mean like the baseball stadium, yeah. the Vanier, like there's, there's no property there. They've turned that all into like parking for the hotel. Like the Hotel Hampton Inn and is there, the conference center or whatever. And it's just like, that's not a great location either. So it's like you have, you don't have a great uh, overpass to get off of the venue parkway. And it's just like, it's, that's a disaster. It was bad for baseball and you're only drawing a few thousand fans there. So what's it going to be if you're trying to get like 17,000 fans there? It's going to be a sense fans want to hear after the way the CTC got built. Oh, and it's like, and with all due respect to Vanya, like nobody's, nobody's excited to go to a Senator's game in Vanya. <laughs> it's like stepping over the chalk. Oh man. It's like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's the Breton, like you said, is great. It's close enough to downtown. You can be to Elgin Street. You can be to the market wherever you like. If you're having dinner first or wanting to go out after, you are right on. Like I said, they built a a, a train stop there for a reason, right? They everyone believed the team was coming, and then suddenly it wasn't. Uh, it, it's again, I hesitate to say like 100. percent It has to be Le Breton, but it's by far the most logical spot. They just have to see if they could get a slightly better deal back that, you know, by all accounts, Melnick and, and that last negotiation had sort of ruined, right? They were going to have this huge piece and then it kind of got shrunk down to like six acres or whatever it was. And they're going to have to find a way to negotiate back up to be able to build in some condos and nightlife. Like you're talking, <laughs> it's doable. I would think, but I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Like it's, I don't know. It'd be handy for me, right? Like, it's not too far from where I am. So, you know, concerts and stuff. Well, I mean, yeah, you have Blues Fest there too. Like there's a, it's, 
It's, I, I think it's the right area to put it in. The whole it's world like, through this, how does this benefit Matt kind of thing, <laughs> right? And I, you know, even if the the Penguins or something are coming in on a Tuesday night to play the Senators, I'm not going all the way up to Canada for that. Might I go over to LeBret? Yes. Everybody whines about Canada. Is Canada's not even that hard to get to anymore. And I think the Queensway has been expanded. It's like everyone's so sour about it. It's like, yeah, well, all right. Pretty fun. Oh, you guys are soft. Like you live in pee and you're like 20 minutes away. Like who cares? Uh, you know, <laughs> cold. Oh like man. 35. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's going to be minus 35 wherever, wherever the arena's is playing. Yeah. It's not getting any warmer. Well, actually it probably is over the next couple of decades, but that's an issue. Someone else. Yeah. Well, probably not going to pin that on Michael and Lauer. Uh, it's interesting, man. I, I, this has been a very long road. It's been a very long Frankly, the story in terms of someone looking to create content every week that has kept on giving, uh, and now it turns the page. And frankly, I've I've been getting kind of borderline diabetes watching how happy Sens fans are today. But I understand it's a big day for you guys, and and honestly, it's better for the league that there isn't this financial financial drag like pulling back on. You know, you don't want city or the the team in the national capital of the home of hockey being kind of an embarrassment that no one really wants to talk about, right? And so... Oh, for sure. I, hey. This group comes in, gets everything back on track. Like you said, some respected players rejoin the, rejoin the organization. You sign a couple free agents. You get people excited with a new arena deal coming. And this could turn pretty quick, right? Oh, for sure. And I think it's like eh, anytime you put a microphone in front of the face of like a Pierre Dorian or a UG Melnick, you're just kind of waiting for the shoe to drop. Like, okay, what, what are they going to say today? And it was great. It was a great bit for like the website. Like you, you run like a transcript of the website and post that and post your own thoughts. And it's like, people love that. But it's like, now if you start adding like credible, like business savvy people who you are totally comfortable in front of a microphone, then obviously that changes. Like, you know, it's like, remember like, like Mark Shapiro came in and, and, and Atkins, Russ Atkins in, in Toronto, um, it's like people criticize him for like the corporate speak and like not saying, saying a lot without saying much after, after Anthopolis and everything else. And they kind of got like ridiculed for it and, and people hated it. And now they're, they seem to be running a really tight ship in Toronto right now. And I'm not sure this, you want to be pointing to them as the way to handle a public. Oh yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. But I mean, you know what I mean though? I do. You know, or it's just, you went from an Anthopolis who would tell you everything to nothing and you know, people resented it a little bit, yeah, but yeah. 100%. Uh, it's, uh, anything else on your mind about the sale, man? It came down, like you said, this morning. Um, it is the end of one era. That's certainly the beginning of another one that I imagine. And, and look, this group couldn't be coming in at a better time. We've talked about, you know, the, the size of the market and everything about it, but this team, if handled correctly over the next six to 18 months, and it's already on the right, but like, if you can augment this young core, what a time to get in on this team, right? You might be at the beginning of a window where they are solid contenders for, I don't know, five, eight years, if you, 10, whatever, right? Like this is a great yeah. time to be getting in on this. And and if you, if you get the right people in to kind of take a look at I'm going to shape this a little bit and we need a piece or two here, like this might be even at $950 million, a brilliant buy low investment for what it might be about to become. Yeah, but I mean, and obviously there's there's some things that you have to be wary of too, right? Like the DeBrincat situation is looming. I think you have, still have like the Hockey Canada sex scandal uh, investigation ongoing. Uh, and there could be implications for the Senators because Drake Batherson and Alex Foreman team uh, are property of the Senators and, and we're on that team. So like, you know, if either of those guys is implicated, then like that could be absolutely disaster. Not that that matters in the greater scheme of sexual assault or anything, but just from like a roster perspective, like that could have like terrible implications for the team. Uh, in the short and medium term. So, I mean, like those are, those could be and he not expecting to see Formanton ever back with the sub. Yeah. And who knows? Like, I'm, I, I don't know anything. I don't have any inside knowledge or, or disappeared into thin air. Off. Yeah. But I mean, he was also the only player who didn't have a contract. So yeah. maybe the optics of that played a huge part. Like if it comes out that Drake Batherson wound up being in, in involved in some way, whether he was in the room or, or engaged in it, then like, how do you, I, I, that's when you can excoriate management for letting a guy in that situation play while another guy sat on the sidelines for a year over in Europe, yeah. you know? Um, but like, you know, both players could be innocent. We have yep. absolutely no idea. So it's, uh, you don't want to, you don't want to judge jury and executioner without having all the information. Right. So, um, 
but I like those are those are complications that could affect the team's short term competitiveness for next season. And then you have this ownership say, okay, well, how long is it going to take for and Lowry to get control of this franchise, and how how long will it take for him to put people into positions of decision making authority? And if it's going to take a while for him to put in a general manager, he can make some moves. Well, that might be in September when you know most rosters are solidified. It, it's going to be hard for hard for that person to make moves that he wants to make at, or he or she wants to make moves at that time. So, um, it's there's a lot of there's a lot of things that have to take place, and it, that's I think you know the next two weeks are going to be kind of critical because I think you'll start to get a little bit more information that'll allow you to figure out, okay, this is when Steve Steos, for example, could come in and, and start making moves, or maybe it's going to be Pierre Dorian for the next while uh, in the interim until, you know, Steos is entrenched or whoever gets brought into the fold is put into place. So and it might be Steos as GM, like... Am I worried? Well, it just... The, uh, w- the window this team's entering into, would you not like to see a little experience? A li- yeah, and I tweeted that earlier. Like, I like obviously, you know, into my office. I'm not sure I'd make him GM. You know, like he's had an advisor role in Edmonton. He worked in player development with the Maple Leafs in the in the mid 2000s. So it's like he's he's had experience in the league before. But you're right. Like he hasn't had uh, assistant general manager experience. He hasn't had general manager experience at the NHL level, even though he's had success at the OHL. OHL level. Yeah. Um, so there is that kind of like, okay, here's a guy who's going to be learning on the job. And Ottawa's kind of in a pivotal stage right now. They can't necessarily afford someone to be making uh, mistakes, like simply learning on the job and making mistakes early in their tenure because they need, you know, after the last few years, like they've made enough mistakes on their own. Like they need, they need someone credible in there who can make decisions. I think, you know, just in terms of hiring someone who can build an analytical department and has experience building an analytical department, I think, you know, candidates, general manager candidates, like, Eric Tulski, uh, who's interviewed for jobs this offseason with like Pittsburgh and stuff. I think those guys are are, are pretty um, intriguing. Or like Alex Mandricki, who's the Seattle AGM, who's has experience working like more on ice and doing a lot of analytical work herself. Like I think those are candidates who are really attractive uh, or prospective hires. You know, like those are people who have like a great, uh, well-rounded background. Who Tulski's an AGM in Carolina and. Mandrake, an AGM in Seattle. So like, you know, they have experience in their roles. They've done it for a year. They've done it for two years. You don't necessarily need an old guard coming in and, you know, you don't have to hire like an old guy for the sake of hiring an old guy just because he has experience. Like, like Dale Talon has had a ton of experience around the league, but like, you don't want Dale Talon coming in here running your franchise. Everyone, everyone drags, everyone drags the old boys club uh, and then they get hired and you're like, oh, the old boys club, you know? So I don't know. It depends on who comes in. Like it's, you have no idea what's going to happen. Maybe it winds up being Dorian who runs the ship and maybe Steos comes in as the president of hockey operations. Maybe that's a possibility as well. I have no idea. No idea. But uh, it's going to be fascinating to watch. And there's a lot of intriguing storylines, even though this is like concluded and you're like, okay, this new chapter, you know, but uh, it's, there's still a lot of work to be done. And it's kind of exciting to think about all the possibilities and it's, there's going to be no shortage of uh, storylines coming out of Ottawa anytime soon. I uh, totally agree with you on that. I appreciate you taking a little time out of your vacation to come do this, man. I, do, I don't know if we pulled you, you know, off the couch. No, my, my son's asleep right now, napping, so this is perfect. So you, you caught me at the opportune time, so. Uh, that's Graham Nichols. The uh, Roman a Day blog we'll link to in the, uh, the show notes. I believe, though, it's just gnichols at substack. That's right. You're right. So, uh, like I said, we'll make sure that's linked uh, everywhere you guys are hearing this. Uh, Graham Nichols, thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. No problem. Thanks, Matt. Thanks so much for listening. My name is Matt Robinson. We'll see you next time. That's it. I cannot work under these conditions. If anybody wants me, I'll be downstairs at McDougal. Call the weekend guy. I don't care.